so I, I work for a technology company. And, uh, and my, uh, my experience in real estate and workplace is a mere five years. Um, but I'll be a bit of a testimony of what happens when a technologist sort of runs into the opportunities that abound in the world of workplace. Um, a key focus for us in terms of customers is working with large enterprise companies. And so what I want to share with you here as a preamble to Dan Johnson's comments is what we are hearing and what we view the landscape to be in terms of corporate workplace. And first off, uh, to, to kick things off, what we've observed is a massive polarity shift. And to shift from a world where the employer dictated workplace to a world where worker-driven decisions are really shaping the where, the when, the what of workplace. Now the backstory behind this is this notion of mobility that we've been talking about for 10 years. Now let me just sort of, if there, in case anyone didn't get the memo, mobility is here. I mean, the train has left the station, and it's not a niche activity. Um, everybody's getting on board. In fact, take a look at uh, Fortune Magazine's uh, rating of best places to work. 82% of Fortune's best places to work have implemented alternative workplace or mobility strategies. Uh, and to quote Michael Joroff, who spoke at the IFMA Summit uh, last month up in Cornell, he says, listen folks, this isn't the future of work anymore. Everyone is mobile and all work is distributed. Who, who doesn't go to sleep with their iPhone next to their bedside table at least a day a week? Okay, not a hand. So if work is mobile, then um, it really challenges uh, a question of what is the corporate workplace in this new world that we're living in right now, where, where the boundaries have been blurred. What, what does the corporate workplace consist of? Well, let's first take a look at what I would call portfolio 1.0, or what the corporate workplace had been. Um, it had consisted of, uh, for corporate real estate leaders, it had consisted of all the assets that were owned or leased by the company. And the unfortunate backstory behind that is that the real utilization of those assets today, and we've all participated in the studies that have yielded this data, are in the order of 35% of actual utilization for assigned workplace. That became a real challenge for us all over the last five years, didn't it? When earnings per share started to suffer and, and economic efficiency were sought. So a lot of attention focused on that challenge. But the reality is the needle's not really been moving, has it? Um, and why is that? Well, where, if I'm a corporate real estate person, if I'm doing all these great efforts to try to improve the utilization of my asset, but it's not really working that well, then where are the people? Where are my employees, my constituents, from a CRE standpoint? Uh, well, the answer is they're in third places. They're in third places, meaning places beyond the campus. Well, what are those? Well, it's coffee shops. It might be my home. It might be my car. It might be the beach house or a co-working space like Rocket Space, or it might be a hotel like Marriott that's getting into the workplace game. It might be office business centers, airport lounges. The point is, a myriad of places, anywhere I can walk with my iPad. So from a corporate real estate standpoint, if that's the reality now, if the workplace, the corporate workplace is not only my assets, but all of these distributed places, well, from a CRE leader standpoint, you know, some questions emerge. Who are these venues? I mean, I'm used to managing my campus, but who are these third places? Who, who's Duncan Logan, right? Um, where are they, and, and what do they offer? Again, I'm used to managing in a very tight fashion my workplace strategy, my guidelines, how I build out and get out of space. We saw a number of extraordinary examples today of clearly thoughtfully designed spaces, but how do I manage in a world where much of the work existence of my employees is taking place in these third environments? Well, let's introduce the notion, if you will, of Portfolio 2.0. If Portfolio 1.0 was all the places that I owned and managed, Let's rethink this from the vantage point of the consumer, of your employees, your constituents. And let's consider that Portfolio 2.0 is any place that my people work. It's certainly my campus. It's those assets that I own and manage. But it's also all of those places that my employees do work on a day-in, day-out basis. It might be office chains like Regis or Preferred Office Network. It might be co-working venues like Rocket Space or Next Space here in San Francisco. And it might even be hotel chains like Marriott that are diving into the workplace as a service business in a big way. Collectively, those are every bit as much my corporate campus now as the own assets that I manage myself. So again, back from the vantage point of a CRE leader, uh, I was used to managing Portfolio 1.0. How do I manage? What is my job? Am I, am I, do I have a role in this new Portfolio 2.0 landscape? And the answer is absolutely. How do I manage it? Well, I manage it with information. We're certainly used to managing real estate in a 1.0 context, right? We put sensors in the ceilings and in the chairs, and we did bed check programs to understand the real utilization of our campuses, to try to make smart, informed decisions. Well, 
There's information available as well in a 2.0 context, but it's different. Let's start with the question, well, what's knowable? If I consider portfolio 2.0 as my campus, what can I know? I want, I want to manage this. I want to have a strategy around it. What's knowable? The answer is an extraordinary amount. The who, the where, the what, the when, the how. It starts by approaching that topic from the point of view that your constituent, your employee, is a consumer. And they're making workplace purchases. They're making decisions about workplace on a day-in, day-out basis. So let's think about trying to absorb the stream of data that comes from the individual people in our companies, rather than just the data that might come from a chair with a sensor in it, or from a bed check survey that it might run on a given day. So let's think about the consumer life cycle of an employee. Let's think about it in consumer terms. And imagine that the consumer life cycle consists of everything from the point where they contemplate a need. You know, I need a private space to work today in New York City, because my my own office is in San Francisco and I'm visiting New York, so I need a place to work for four. That starts as a thought, and maybe even an interaction with a piece of software. But that, that, would, that might be a nice thing to know, right? Um, I might then go into an app, and the backstory here is that we're doing software that does this stuff. Um, but, but again, this is all knowable. Um, it might evolve into the where, right? So I had a need, I need a space for four people. Um, maybe I look at a venue and I see that there's a steel case Marriott Workspring in New York City. So I select that. I prescribe a time. So it can be known that at one o'clock, that was the requirement for this four-person work event. Um, maybe I book it with my phone, spend $95. So the price of this workspace is also knowable for this particular consumer. I invite Chris Mock and Dan Johnson and Ed Nolan to this meeting with me. So now I know the with whom. Um, I checked in at 157, so I actually know when I arrived at this venue, and after I finished using it, I actually gave it a positive thumbs up in this piece of consumer software. So I even know what the experience was like. And I can correlate all of that back to an individual. Now, now imagine that that type of consumer behavior is happening again and again and again. Every time employees are choosing places, that type of data stream is available. Very rich in context, far richer than the anonymous data that I might have gotten from a chair sensor or from a bed check. So let's take a quick peek into what a workplace graph might look like. Someone this morning mentioned social graphs. You know, LinkedIn is a pretty good proxy for my professional social graph. But my workplace graph looks a lot like this particular person. This is a real guy at Accenture. So his workplace graph, real data extracted from our software for the benefit of Dan Johnson at Accenture. We know that on September 12th, he worked at a co-working space for two and a half hours with three colleagues from Accenture. Spent $165. We know that uh, on September 16th, he spent $35 to work at a co-working space in Berkeley by himself to avoid driving into San Francisco, save the drive time, save the carbon footprint. We know that three subsequent uh, transactions all actually happened within three blocks of the Accenture campus at office centers and co-working spaces. Interestingly, because those were days where there wasn't space available inside the corporate campus. And so in this case, these third places were serving as overflow. Collectively, what this behavior represents is the consumerization of real estate, the consumerization of workplace, where individuals are making choices about how and where and when they work. As well, it's a solution wherein, or it's a world wherein corporate real estate leaders can tap into that data stream and begin to have insights into how their people are working. So imagine being able to pull that level of detail and context back into the company to think about designing your own internal spaces as well. I, I, I left my voice in Miami, so I apologize for, for that. Um, uh, I'm actually Mark's color commentary. He said he was my preamble, but we're going we're gonna to flip it the other way. just wanted to spend a couple of minutes to talk to you about what we're doing at Accenture. Um, and the story goes back about a dozen years. Um, we've been in the hoteling business ever since Carolyn and I actually started working together right there in the middle um, about 13 years ago. And um, what we were splitting from um, Arthur Anderson at the time, and it really gave us an opportunity to rethink a dozen plus years ago about a strategy where we would put less emphasis on corporate space and more on investment in technology and mobility. So I think many, many companies today are talking about this. Um, I like to think that we got about a, a 10 or 12 year head start on it. Uh, and it's made a big, big difference for the company. Um, most of you probably will know that we went public in the, the year 2000. And, <clears throat> sorry, one of the things that happened was, you know, 
going from a private partnership to a public company, um, all of a sudden other people were starting to look at our operating costs and our expenses. Um, and our SGNA and our general administrative expenses and percent of revenue were really very, very high for a public company. Um, we worked very carefully on the real estate and workplace strategy over the next dozen or so years to make a really significant reduction in that. Um, and we're among best in class now there. Um, I think the key here is that um, for our company, the workplace really represented about a third of our GMA expense. So what we did with workplace was really pivotal to the organization. So what, what we really found was that we were able to sort of maintain the portfolio while we dramatically supported headcount growth. And at the same time, we made our people more happy. We introduced mobility and flexibility. So what you're just seeing here is a picture of, of US data that really shows the consistency in the portfolio over the last many years while headcount revenue have grown dramatically. And probably even more importantly on the bottom is just a quick snapshot of the improvement in our employee engagement, which of course is impacted by lots of different things. But um, you know, the work environment, the work that you do is a big piece of that. Um, the other thing is I think we're a very young organization. And um, I think this is probably typical of a number of professional services companies and you know, startups and so forth. But for a really large corporation to have you know, 3 percent of their population be baby boomers like me, um, and the gigantic majority being um, you know, millennials, and in fact, we're thinking about the next generation, is really causing us to make some decisions about what do we want to do for that future population. Um, we all have smartphones, and we all ask ourselves, how much more can we sweat the asset and still make people happier? So Mark and I connected a little over a year ago, and um, we started to look at liquid space. Um, we've always been a virtual organization. Um, we played around with you know, Second Life for recruiting and a bunch of things like that. But, but the key message here is that we uh, really distinguish virtual work from distributed work. And uh, distributed work is absolutely the backbone of how we do our business. Um, mobility is a reality for everybody in the company. It doesn't matter if your business practices, legal marketing, HR, or whatever. Um, people are on the road, working from home, whatever, all of the time. Um, we also took a really careful look at our carbon footprint. Um, it's very easy. It's two-thirds business travel and one-third real estate. Um, so we're putting a lot of energy on using technology to dramatically reduce both of those. This is a picture not of my heart rate when I went to the doctor, but uh, it's actually our utilization of office space um, day by day. So you know we do bed checks like lots of companies do today. This happens to be a picture of one of our buildings um, in Chicago, and um, what you'll see here is that you know Mondays and Fridays are very, very empty. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is very full, um, and so it really gave us the opportunity to sort of right size our portfolio a little bit by looking at what our peak utilization was, and in the process of that, we saved about a million and a half dollars a year. But what we're doing with um, liquid space is looking at how can we really trim off the peaks of our utilization by encouraging and allowing people to have more choice in terms of where they're working. And every time we do that, we have the opportunity to reduce um, you know, another chunk of space. It might be a floor. It might be part of a floor. It might mean that we don't open an office somewhere where we have people. Um, but it's a, it's a very significant opportunity for us. Our work patterns differ fairly dramatically from city to city. This happens to be Chicago, where we've got a lot of volatility on Mondays and Fridays. New York is pretty full all of the time, and so what we're looking at there, just to give you a different view of the same uh, kind of solution, is how could we defer expansion by leveraging liquid space, service offices, and third places uh, to really expand our utilization um, without growing the portfolio. So this is something we launched, gosh, uh, three weeks ago, three weeks, four weeks maybe, um, and in the first week we loaded 1,520 people in New York into the liquid space system, giving them access to 60 plus locations instead of one location um, on 6th Avenue. Um, so, you know, the employees are using it, we're holding client meetings there, and it's working very, very well for us. So that's what we're doing, and did we leave time for a couple of questions? We do have time for questions. Yep. Anybody have questions for Dan? Or Mark. Or Mark. Jim. Jim. Jim Ware with Future of Work and I Compare Journal. Dan, uh, it's, it's, 
combine Mark's comments about consumerization and consumer choice with what you just described, I guess I have to ask the question about cost and cost control. In effect, your real estate costs have become a, a, a bottom-up driven by, by the, the, the workforce. And how, how are you tracking that? And it, it, how do you know it's better than it was? I'm just curious yeah. about well, I mean, I think cost. Mark, Mark gave, a, gave an example of the kind of data that we get. Um, you know, we look very, very closely at what is our actual utilization and how do we right-size the portfolio. Historically, we've sort of taken it to how can we reduce our fixed cost and still contain demand. Um, what we're shifting to now is really something that says how can we have a more a better informed mix of fixed and variable cost to support that demand. So, you know, we're looking to sort of centrally fund that distributed usage. Um, in, in most instances, if we have project teams that are, you know, have a, a high reimbursable number or something, we can, we can charge that. But it's very easy for us to look at what the incremental expense is of that use versus the savings that, we, that we've taken into account. Yeah. Can I share some New York, please? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I know in New York, um, if they had continued with business as usual, which would have been to outfit another floor in their building, they were looking at, they've already priced out a $520,000 year lease. It would have been a short-term lease, five years. Not for a full floor. Uh, not for a full floor. Yeah. Um, and uh, in, in the precursor to taking a step into the liquid space with their New York team, they priced out uh, what they thought it would be to serve that spike of actual demand. Because it turns out the real demand was 9 to 11, typically Monday through Thursday, and it fell off quite a bit in the summer. Right? So it's a very, very defined scenario. Um, what, their, what their prediction showed was that their cost utilizing third places in the immediate vicinity of similar caliber would have been 200 or is 250k a year. So, yeah. so on a hard ROI basis, they've got 100% ROI for a purely variable solution uh, that they can ebb and flow with as they need. And, and the other piece of that is, you know, our, our strategy is to bring to the, the minimum core our fixed cost portfolio. So, you know, we used to have five floors in San Francisco, uh, seven, five in uh, New York. Now, you know, we've got two, and we won't grow. <coughs> If we're going to look for the, the variable, the market, all that for us. So, Dan and Mark can answer this too. You've done a really good job of, of evolving your workplace program using data to inform little tweaks that you make. And I know you used to track, um, you used to ask people whether they wanted to come to the work, right. the work market or whether they felt like they had to. So, have you now reached a place where eccentric people come in because they want to rather than feeling this cultural norm? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're a little bit different because the huge part of our population is actually face-to-face -face with each other at the client engagement. So, you know, in terms of kind of the, the culture piece and how do you feel connected to the organization, that really happens to a big part of the organization, you know, sort of four or five days a week already. Um, you know, but a dozen years ago, the reasons you came into the office were, you know, land speed meetings and the expectation that you had to be there. Today, it's because you've got to get your laptop fixed or your out of expense control envelopes. So it's, it's changed from that. And you know, community, I'm, I'm being a little bit smart because community is a big thing and we make a huge investment in that, but um, it's not to do individual work. Peter, did you have a question and then we'll um, move on. To Thank you, good question, great presentation. What um, advice would you have for more mature organizations with a more mature population that are just beginning the journey? All the great work of Accenture the last 12 years and Mark, your offering is really progressive, but if you've got Organizations who are not quite culturally ready or as advanced, what would you offer as a suggestion? Um, yeah, I, th I think for my part, it would be not to be afraid of technology and to, to put your, uh, your investment and your trust there. Um, our whole future strategy is really based on video. Um, and I think that really bridges a lot of the things that people feel like they're perhaps losing connection with when they make that move. And I would add that this notion of consumerization doesn't mean you have to blow up your real estate strategy. You can explore consumerization within your four walls. The existence of communal areas like this, the existence of bookable or reservable assets inside the four walls of your campus is consumer choice. So give your employees consumer choice and trust them to make those decisions within the safe you know, confines of your existing footprint. And then you can step carefully into third places as well if you wish. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. Okay.